All right, well, uh, good afternoon to everyone in Europe and good morning to everyone in the US. Uh, uh, we're very excited to have Arun talk to us about his uh, newest project. Uh, and why don't you take it away, Arun? All right, thanks, Andre. And uh, thank you to uh, everybody for the invitation to present at the seminar. My apologies for, thank you guys for showing up. I mean, I know I canceled last time. So although there, um, I feel like the, um, following canceling a seminar, the probability that the speaker will show up the next time I feel is sort of slightly higher than like, you know, the base rate. So um, this, this, this was sort of a reliable bet for you guys to make. Um, <clears throat> so this is joint work with uh, Apostolos Philippas, who is an assistant professor at Fordham and was a PhD student here until two or three years ago. Um, and Shrikan Jagabatula, who is um, a colleague of mine in the operations management group of my department. Um, and uh, Apostolos, I'm hoping, will be um, calling in during this, uh, during this seminar so that um, he can take all the difficult questions. Um, and, uh, you know, his uh, <clears throat> was sort of the primary driver of the experiment um, that will follow spent time with the company actually sort of implementing the experiment. Um, but I'll get to that in a bit. Um, the, um, I guess the, the, the motivation for me for this project uh, was um, an, a, a deep interest in platforms over the last 10 years. Um, a, a view that there's a new mix of things that these platforms are doing um, that to me distinguishes them from being the kind of hands-off marketplace that eBay was when it first emerged um, or Craigslist continues to be where um, there is sort of minimal responsibility taken by the platform in facilitating the economic activity. And um, those platforms are really sort of matching markets or, um, um, you know, perhaps even sort of a lighter touch than like, you know, sort of a, a, a coordinated matching market. There are simply places to sort of aggregate supply and demand. Um, a lot of more modern platforms, some of which, um, you know, I've written about a lot under the umbrella of the sharing economy, but, you know, others sort of see more broadly as including, you know, YouTube and Amazon seller marketplace and Taobao in China. Um, do a wide variety of other things. They, you know, facilitate search, they facilitate discovery, they facilitate matching. Some of them, you know, um, determine what the transaction price is going to be. Um, you know, the early markets would use auction mechanisms. Some of them still do. Um, you know, modern marketplaces like Uber um, will often, you know, determine what the price is according to a preset algorithm. Um, most modern platforms facilitate some sort of, um, you know, transaction cost minimizing um, or facilitate the lowering of transaction costs by providing some kind of trust and risk management that, you know, increases the likelihood that trade will actually occur. This could include insurance, it could include like, you know, a, feedback-based reputation system. Um, it could include um, standardization of terms. Um, and then, you know, some platforms like Amazon's um, marketplace provide logistics and delivery um, or, you know, DoorDash, which matches restaurants with um, people who want to eat at, who want to sort of order food from them. So there's a broad mix of things that these platforms do. Um, you know, if it was a different audience, I would sort of try and convince you that platforms are different enough to sort of warrant independent um, study. Uh, but but I'm, I'm just gonna sort of dive into what the, you know, what the context of this research problem is and um, like, you know, what the research was. So, um, so, so, so this was motivated by um, an observation that many of these platforms seem to face what appears to be a somewhat unique challenge, which is that, um, you know, we like organizations always face the, you know, the issues of adverse selection and moral hazard when 
you know, uh, managers or owners delegate um, activities to, to agents. Um, and, 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 and there's a variant of that in platforms, um, except that, uh, you know, there are a, the, the, the key distinguishing factor here seemed to be that the nature of the relationship between the platform and the provider, the entity that you know, sort of sitting on the other end that is actually the supplier in a sense, the seller, the Airbnb host, the person who's renting out the car, the person who's, you know, driving the car, the person who, the, the, the restaurant that is selling you the food. Um, all of those I collectively refer to as providers in, in, in the rest of the talk. Um, frequently, uh, these are non-experts. And so like, you know, this was sort of most salient to me in the case of Airbnb, where we have millions of people who have become providers of short-term accommodation who by and large don't have any formal training or prior experience in becoming, in, in, in sort of providing this kind of short-term accommodation. Um, but they are, depending on the platform, given a bunch of tactical decisions that they need to make. Um, they are often like, you know, sort of uh, um, given um, inventory um, choice decisions, they are often given the choice of deciding whether or not they accept a transaction. Um, they are often, you know, asked to price what they are selling. Um, and, you know, this could make sense if um, the provider has better local information. Um, but, you know, sort of as platforms grow, they tend to have potentially sort of superior, a superior ability to make some of these decisions. Um, but, you know, just sort of sticking with the Airbnb example, because it's familiar, um, you know, unlike a hotel chain, which has a formalized revenue management system where inventory and pricing decisions are being made centrally, um, with Airbnb, um, there's sort of a much greater level of decentralization involved in these choices. And, you know, so one trade-off here and like, you know, where should the decisions be made um, has to do with, um, you know, who has better information and um, who has better capabilities. Um, the platform has better capabilities ostensibly, the, you know, provider has better information. Um, there's often a misalignment of incentives and this is not entirely new, right? I mean, you know, there are always misalignment of incentives between owners and managers, but um, that exists potentially for, you know, a platform versus any individual provider. Um, there may be sort of a pattern of availability sticking with the Airbnb example, a pattern of availability and pricing um, that may optimize um, like, you know, the total amount of business done over like, you know, sort of the Airbnb platform while not serving like, you know, the interests of any individual um, provider. Um, and it's more than that, the metric by which um, the performance of the platform like sort of ends up being like, you know, ends up the, the metric that ends up mattering to the platform may be different from the metric that ends up mattering to the providers because the platform may not sort of hold the capital or incur certain costs that providers do. Um, you know, I mean, at the outset of the pandemic, uh, within a few months of the pandemic sort of hitting, um, both Uber and Hertz suffered a sort of very significant uh, top line hit. I mean, they both saw revenue declines from their core business. Um, Uber saw an 80% decline, Hertz saw close to a 90% decline. Hertz, you know, filed for bankruptcy soon after because, you know, their cost structure is very different. They hold the leases on the cars that, you know, were lying dormant. Uber, on the other hand, partly because, of course, they have Uber Eats, but partly because of the fact that their cost structure is fundamentally different, um, you know, survived and thrived. And so, you know, it both has to do with, um, you know, sort of the individual versus the collective and um, optimizing different objective functions potentially. Um, plus, you know, and, and, and this is sort of really outside the realm of, um, you know, my core expertise, but, you know, it's important to bring up that there are certain things that facilitate control um, by traditional organizations over their employees um, that platforms do not possess. Um, you know, there's 
like, you know, this corporate culture, there's like, you know, sort of a uh, set of instructions that an employee can be given as like, you know, this is how business needs to be done. Um, that ensures a consistent brand experience. Now, if you're an Airbnb host, every time a guest stays at an Airbnb property, Airbnb is putting their brand on the line in a sense, but they have no directive authority over the host in terms of like, you know, sort of setting standards in the same way that, you know, a Hilton franchisee might have for its employees to ensure a consistent brand, brand management experience. And so there are new sort of provider management challenges. So every platform that I've encountered is trying to sort of balance um, both choose like, you know, what are we going to do? And then, you know, sort of contingent on what we're doing, um, you know, sort of how do we balance decentralization and control? And um, like the final sort of stage setting point before I sort of get into the details of what we actually did and why it matters um, is that I've noticed that platforms seem to become less decentralized over time. That as they start out um, light touch, they start out designed for rapid, rapid scaling and sort of minimum liability. And then, you know, as they get bigger, they have more data um, and therefore are actually sort of able to take advantage. They have greater expertise because like, you know, they've hired people, they've hired data scientists. Um, they may have a need for consistency as they grow. Um, they may face competitors who are um, doing certain things that cause them to want to increase the scope of the decisions that they make. And um, so they have to manage this transition from being light touch to sort of being a little more heavy handed. And that, 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 that can be a challenge. Um, you know, there are a few examples of like, you know, successful and unsuccessful management of this kind of transition where the scope of decision authority um, that the platform took on um, changed or the platform takes on and the platform delegated changed um, sort of during the evolution. And my first couple of examples are again of Airbnb, even though my data is not from Airbnb, which is there was a point in Airbnb's evolution where they introduced this feature of instant book. And if you think about it from the platform's point of view, they have multiple choices. Like, you know, prior to this um, feature being introduced um, in order for a guest to um, stay at a particular Airbnb, the host had to agree to accept the guest. The guest had to request the host and the host had to agree. And uh, this is unlike booking a hotel room where you don't have to ask for permission. You just sort of book the hotel room. And so naturally sort of a point of evolution in Airbnb becoming sort of like, you know, more standardized was, hey, can we like, you know, switch to a model where um, people can book a property directly. Um, and you could think of three choices. One choice being, now nah, I just sort of stick with the status quo, um, allow hosts to have a final decision over whether or not they accept a guest. Second is switch to a system where like, you know, um, once a guest requests a property, it is automatically granted. And the third was sort of the middle ground where introduce this as a feature where hosts can opt in to decide whether or not they want to, um, you know, allow guests to book instantly. And so the reason why I'm sort of delving deep into like, you know, what is sort of a seemingly trivial feature on Airbnb is that it involves a somewhat complex set of factors for the platform to decide whether or not like, you know, they're going to make the switch, how are they going to make the switch? And there are multiple options available. Um, you might think of Airbnb as having sort of gone through a similar process um, when they, um, you know, uh, when, you know, when in, in, in my mind, they realized that, um, you know, they could potentially sort of set prices in a way that was more efficient for, you um, uh, some providers and for the platform as a whole. Um, and again, they had three choices. They could either sort of let the host continue to price. They could, um, you know, set the prices themselves and mandate that that was the way the platform was gonna work much like Uber does or a wide variety of platforms do. Or they could say, well, here is the price that we think you should be charging. You can take it or leave it. Or, you know, there's a wide variety of other options and they ended up choosing the middle ground where um, like, you know, they offered this pricing system as a pricing tool. And that was sort of a decision that they made relative to mandating the pricing or doing nothing. 
Um, there are other examples of platforms that have made this kind of transition. Didi, the ride sharing platform in China, um, <clears throat> you know, used to allow drivers to accept rides or not. Um, they switched to a system where they took away the control from drivers and assigned rides to drivers. Um, Lyft early in its evolution did not have a price at all. Um, you know, there was a suggested donation that, um, you know, they, the ride was free and you could donate to the driver and they had to make the transition from a donation based system, which is what they were in 2012, when I first used them to, you know, actually sort of setting a price and deciding like, you know, and that, that was another transition. Um, Sidecar, which was a Lyft competitor, um, and an Uber competitor for many years. And one of the pioneers actually in the ride sharing space, um, tried a different pricing structure where, um, you know, rather than saying it's up to the um, rider, they tried a system in which it was up to the driver, where rather than the platform setting prices, each individual driver could decide on what their pricing was going to be. Um, they had like a little tool. And so when you um, requested a ride, you would get like, you know, multiple drivers, each with their own wait time, their car and the price that you would pay for the ride. Um, it turned out that, um, you know, this was not a feature that the market wanted. And, um, you know, it didn't work out well for sidecar. A different kind of transition, you know, was experienced by TaskRabbit, which was one of the early, you know, back in 2012, when people talked about this new platform economy, they would talk about Uber and Airbnb and TaskRabbit. Um, TaskRabbit was then a sort of an, an auction marketplace where you could list whatever you wanted done and then, you know, providers would bid on it. Um, they switched to a more centralized, more uniform, more standardized marketplace um, in 2014, where they had different categories. Um, the users basically or the the providers revolted i think two-thirds of the providers actually left the platform following this transition and this was sort of a turning point in the evolution of the company um where in my opinion they didn't really sort of live up to their early potential and eventually sold themselves to ikea for you know about a hundred million dollars which is you know a successful exit but still not compared to some of the peers that they had early on so anyway, those are many of the examples that I think sort of motivate our study, which is, you know, when you are thinking about making this trade-off between centralizing and decentralizing a decision in a platform setting, and you have a current status quo where a certain set of decisions are being made by the platform and other decisions are being made by the providers and you have to make this transition you know what are the kinds of trade-offs that you face and um, so the partner that we worked with was a um, leading peer-to-peer uh, -peer car rental platform which uh, shall remain unnamed um, the business that this platform is in is um, in facilitating the rental of cars um, owned by providers to people who want to rent cars. So it's like Hertz or Avis, you go on the platform, you open it up, you say that this is the date that I want, um, uh, this is the window of time that I want the car for, and then you're given a bunch of options and you're also given a bunch of locations. Um, these aren't of course car rental counters, these are where the cars are actually located. I'm sure many of you have used these um, car rental services. Um, the key difference, of course, between this platform and something like Hertz or Avis is that um, a um, that the <clears throat> cars are not actually being rented to you by the platform. They're being rented to you by a provider on the other end who owns the car. A majority of these are owned by individuals who are, for example, renting out their second car. There are also a number of small businesses that might have a fleet of like, you know, five to 10 cars that they are then providing on the platform. And, um, you know, there are um, some, some sort of other exceptions. Um, for a while, um, there used to be a service in the Bay Area called City Car Share. Um, <clears throat> I think they had like 300 cars for rent. Um, there was a period where they started to offer this um, car rental entirely through the get around platform. 
Um, I don't know if that is still the case, but um, you know, I did notice that they stopped sort of offering these cars directly and started operating through a platform. So vast majority of these are individuals providing their personal car or second car, but there are also some other providers. And um, <clears throat> you know, at the time that we studied the platform, the status quo was that a provider would provide its um, availability, the vehicle availability, they would set the price and they had transaction approval in the way that I described the sort of Airbnb pre-instant booking where you know, the person who wanted to rent the car would say, I want to rent the car. And then the person who owned the car could say yes or no. So they could decide whether a requested transaction was actually approved. And this sort of matters a little in what follows. Um, if you're a renter, you search, you <clears throat> compare and choose. And so they are providing some of that matching and discovery um, capability, the platform. Um, they're also providing an access technology. Um, this is the technology that, you know, at least I first saw with Zipcar, where you could sort of, in a decentralized way, um, open the car um, without actually going and picking up a key from somewhere. Um, in the case of these peer-to-peer -peer car rental platforms, it is typically with your smartphone now, you will unlock the car. Um, and they also provide some dispute resolution. They have a rating system for both um, renters and owners, and they provide um, insurance. Um, and that was a critical innovation for the early movers in the space, um, partnering with an insurance company to create an insurance product that actually um, you know, allowed me as a driver who had my own insurance, but was not insured to drive your car um, to drive your car while sort of like, you know, I, I can't drive it under my insurance, under your personal insurance. And so this was sort of a peer-to-peer -peer car rental insurance product that, um, you know, Relay Rides, which was an early mover here and get around as well. These two early companies in the United States created an insurance product that facilitated this. So those were their responsibilities at the time that um, we started the study and the providers controlled availability, pricing, and transaction approval. And of course, made the choice as to whether or not to offer their car. And this is what the pricing tool looked like for a provider. Um, they would move a slider in order to control how much the car cost per hour. And that would translate into a daily and a weekly rate um, in a pretty sort of systematic way. The daily rate was 10 times the hourly rate and the weekly rate was six times the daily rate. So this was their one sort of tool that they had. Um, and some providers wanted, you know, sort of the ability to price differently on weekdays and weekends. Um, but that was the status quo. Um, the, uh, you know, prior to us running the experiment, um, and I, I don't remember exactly what window of time this uh, was for, but it was certainly before we um, sort of like, you know, went through any transition. Um, the two, two observations about activity on the platform, one was that um, vehicle utilization as measured by like, you know, the number of hours a vehicle was rented divided by the number of hours that it was listed as being available on the platform was fairly low. Um, <clears throat> you know, a vast majority of uh, cars were not rented for a majority of the time that they were made available. Um, part of this could be because like, you know, some people would list their cars as being available 24 hours a day. Um, but, you know, it still seemed like a, you know, given the promise of peer-to-peer -peer car rental as being like, you know, hey, we'll sort of, you know, monetize your idle capacity. It felt like, you know, utilization was low and people within the company felt that they could increase utilization. Um, and the second observation was that people didn't change prices very frequently. And so if you measure the number of price changes per month that a typical provider would perform, um, you know, it was a relatively small number of people who were making any changes at all. Um, the platform felt that they could increase utilization. They had hired a team of data scientists who were saying, hey, we can do better than this. And the major competitor of the platform centralized pricing, um, like, you know, sort of prior to this whole thing beginning. And so in um, 2015, um, we did a 
sort of an informal pilot. I, I won't report on the results of that, but it sort of taught me a few things. Um, this was voluntary. People like, you know, were asked whether they wanted to participate in this. A handful of people participated in it. Half of them dropped out. Um, when we asked them, why did you drop out? Um, some people just wanted to sort of control their pricing um, and were uncomfortable with the platform setting the price. Um, the two more interesting reactions were, there was a set of people who <clears throat> felt that the platform was pricing their car too low, um, <clears throat> not from a revenue optimization point of view, but from the point of view of, hey, if people think that this is an inexpensive car, then they're gonna treat it badly. And so I wanna keep my price high because I wanna sort of ensure that there's high perceived value so that someone is responsible when they use my car. They think it's a $35 an hour car, not a $10 an hour car, um, which was sort of interesting. We never really sort of dug very deep into that in our experiment, but it's, it's, it's sort of an interesting direction for future work. And there was another set of people who dropped out because, you know, the reaction was, hey, like, you know, a mile away, there's another Camry that's being listed for 14 bucks an hour and you're pricing my thing at seven, it's not fair. So anyway, when we, um, the platform was keen on rolling out a centralized pricing system. They wanted to sort of, they had decided that this was going to be the pricing structure that they would vary sort of hourly rate um, based on hour of day and based on day of week in sort of a continuous fashion. And, um, you know, we believed that, you know, a middle ground might be a good thing to explore. I mean, based on, <clears throat> you know, the experience of other platforms and so on. And so the experiment eventually consisted of three groups, about 70% um, of our sample was, um, you know, left exactly the way that um, they were. They were, um, you know, they had complete control over their pricing. Um, about 15% of our um, group um, pricing control was taken away from them completely. And so this was the first treatment group. And the second treatment group um, pricing was control was taken away from them, but they had some ability to, um, you know, sort of raise or lower the price, um, like, you know, sort of based on, um, and then let, let me actually show you the interface. So this was the status quo. Um, <clears throat> the first treatment group where the pricing was completely centralized. Um, did someone have a question? Okay. Um, where pricing was completely centralized, the interface looked like this. And so it was sort of a continuous price depending on time of day. And it was a seven day sort of pricing schedule. And what the um, user would be shown was here's sort of the sort of the integral under the curve um, price that would be charged if you rented this out for 24 hours. And, um, <clears throat> you know, depending on the window that was requested, um, the price was set according to sort of what hours this overlapped with. So this was sort of a non-trivial pricing, centralization of pricing. It wasn't sort of simple. Um, and the partially decentralized um, was exactly the same thing, except we also gave them a slider in which they could sort of raise or lower the curve by up to 30% on both sides. And so they could either sort of, you know, if they set this in a way that it was up by 20%, then every price on the centralized schedule was 20% higher than the centralized algorithm prescribed it to be. If they set it at say 30% lower then the entire curve was lowered by 30%. Okay, so these were the three treatment groups, um, centralized, partially decentralized, and um, the control was status quo T0. So we ran this experiment for eight weeks and we studied a number of outcomes and uh, the results I'm gonna report to you are sort of very straightforward of the form um, you know, let's look at the um, treatment effects for each of the true treatment groups and compare them to the control. Um, <clears throat> and so the graphs I'm gonna be showing you are, you know, should be interpreted as like, you know, by what fraction, um, it's, this says percentage, but it's really fraction, by what fraction was the outcome of the treatment group different from the outcome of the control group? 
Um, and um, so the first set of results are for the group treatment one, where control was completely taken away. And um, over that eight week experimental period for this treatment one group, revenue went up by a little over 50% on average. Um, and so <clears throat> the revenue that was generated by a provider on average was substantially higher than like, you know, for a control. Um, this revenue increase came from a dramatic increase in the utilization. And so the utilization of the number of hours rented for, actually, let me say that more precisely, the number of hours that a provider who was in the group treatment one um, rented their vehicle out relative to one in the control group was um, like, you know, about, you know, 130 to 140% about like, you know, a factor was higher than the control group by over a factor of two. Um, and so from those metrics, I mean, like, you know, the centralization of pricing seemed to be a success. You know, there was a dramatic increase in revenue and a dramatic increase in um, like, you know, sort of the volume of business that this, um, these providers were getting. Now, <clears throat> on the other hand, there was also a very significant negative reaction from people in this, in this treatment group. And this was of great interest to us because part of our interest was in like, you know, sort of like, you know, how, how, how should these transitions be managed? And so compared to the control group, um, the churn rate of the treatment one group went up by 30%. Sorry, can I ask? Can I ask a question? It's uh, Jacques Cremer speaking. Please. I mean, of course, you would have very strong incentives to put down uh, yourself at 95%. I mean, you are playing a game against a whole bunch of people. Some of them, and you've been told how the others are pricing. So I assume that lots of people must have priced just below the, uh, you know, what just below one because you knew that the people who are in the centralized group were you know, at the slider set at exactly at one. I mean, well, it seems um, to be a strange way of doing things. I mean, because in some sense you have a, a game uh, which is being played by the different renters <clears> and you know, one of them, you're, you're announcing the strategy and you're preventing, I mean, one of them is a first mover, but here you've got the first mover disadvantage, it seems clear to me. Yeah, you, you, you'd you imagine that. I mean, there are a couple of... Um, so and Actually, I think the graph you just showed us for about half a tenth of a second was showing this, wasn't it? Um, At the well, bottom of the previous slide. Uh, yeah. No, no, well, no. It, it, it was actually showing just above. I mean, this, this was, um, you know, just illustrating... No, no, the next slide. Yeah. Next slide. Next. So this is, is, no, no. Yeah, so the bottom uh, thing is just showing that people are pricing just below. Uh, oh, that's the centralized one, sorry. Yeah, sorry, yeah. sorry, sorry, I was wrong. Okay. Yeah, no, I mean, you know, the, your, your, your intuition sort of makes a lot of sense that you anticipate that the people who have a little bit of control would just sort of set the slider a little below um, and so they are pricing just below like, you know, the 15% who are in the treatment one group. One thing is that, um, you know, the participants did not know that what these fractions were. Um, they were simply informed that this is the group you're in. Um, and the second thing is that, um, you know, the, 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 the entire set consists of, you know, this is a small numbers experiment. There are like, you know, sort of thousands of providers there's a great deal of heterogeneity in the product. Um, you know, not all of these are exactly the same car. Um, they are all in different locations. And so, um, you know, it's not entirely common that you have an identical competitor, um, like, you know, who is a perfect substitute for you. So these are sort of differentiated on many dimensions. Thank you. Arun, I just wanted to let you know that you have uh, five minutes left. So oh, um, all right. okay. yeah, use Maybe. your time well. All right. So, um, you know, so the, the um, well, what we observed in terms of non-price reactions by participants, you know, you take pricing control away from them. So they react with whatever sort of levers they have. Um, there was a substantial increase in the rate of exit from the platform. 
um, there was a substantial decrease in the extent to which they provided availability. And so you reacted to, hey, the pricing is not what I liked, but like, you know, so I'm going to pull some of my inventory. And there was also a substantial increase in, I'm not sure why this isn't showing up, um, the cancellation rates of um, like, you know, sort of this, this group. Um, this group had substantially higher cancellation rates than the control group. Now, the interesting contrast comes in comparing treatment group one with treatment group two, because in some ways, these were two of the three choices that the platform could make, do nothing, um, like, you know, centralized pricing completely and then provide partial control. So with partial control, what we noticed was that, um, like, you know, the revenue impact was roughly the same. Um, people who had partial control saw the same revenue increases on average. But those revenue increases came with a substantially lower increase in the number of hours rented. So there was some sort of optimization they were doing that was allowing them to um, sort of generate the same revenue with fewer hours rented. Um, what was more interesting from a managerial point of view is there were substantially lower, significantly lower exit rates. The churn rate of this group was substantially lower. Um, the availability curtailing of this rate was also substantially lower. And um, this is not going to show you yeah, the cancellation rates for this group were also substantially lower. And so the non-price reaction of this group that had partial control was, you could say, as anticipated significantly less adverse for the platform than like, you know, the centralized group. And so you saw a revenue increase, which was good for the platform, but you saw these adverse reactions. And in many ways, the decision at hand was like, you know, sort of what do we do next? Um, and so, you know, just to sort of summarize this contrast, I mean, like, you know, the exit rates for the treatment one group were significantly higher, the availability sort of cutting was um, significantly higher and the cancellation rate was significantly higher for the people who had no control. And giving them partial control seemed to sort of uh, lower the churn rate, lower the rate at which they were sort of cutting inventory and uh, lower the rate at which they were canceling um, like, you know, requested transactions. So in my last two minutes, um, let me sort of try and understand, sort of help you understand you know, well, why do we see these differences? I mean, and there are two theories that we've got sort of, you know, we've partially tested in some sense. Um, one is the theory that, um, you know, the cost structure that is, um, or like, you know, the, optim the, the objective function of the providers is different from the objective function of the platform. The platform wants to maximize revenue um, because they take a straight commission on revenue. Um, the uh, provider, on the other hand, is bearing different kinds of costs. One cost is simply a per transaction cost. There is some sort of bring to market cost that you might think of as associated with like, you know, sort of checking out the guest, like, you know, so deciding um, that you're going to sort of be engaging in this transaction. And the second cost is a increased depreciation cost. I mean, if someone is driving your car, yeah, they're putting in the fuel, but there's a greater level of depreciation that you are bearing per mile driven. Um, and so we, we, we did notice that for the treatment group one, the revenue they were generating per mile was significantly lower. We didn't have a way of directly estimating what these costs were. But one explanation for this difference in sort of like, you know, the non-price reactions of treatment group one was that the sort of like, you know, the net profit that they seem to be collecting without being able to adjust price to sort of adjust demand um, was significantly lower. They were making less money per mile and less money per transaction. And which is sort of why they were reacting in that adverse way. Um, the second difference is more of a sort of a, a behavioral difference. We surveyed them after the experiment was over and we found that people in treatment group two were significantly more satisfied with the intervention than people in treatment group one. Um, this is despite the fact that they generated exactly the same sort of level of revenue increase on average, roughly the same revenue increase on average. And so um, like, you know, the, my, my colleagues in the management department have taught me about something that um, like, you know, this concept of a psychological contract that emerges between employees and employers 
which is like, these are not contracted on explicitly, but these are expectations that I have about how I'm going to be treated or what the rules of engagement are. And when you change those without, even if it's not contracted upon, the um, employees can react adversely to that kind of change. And it's possible that there was something akin to a psychological contract violation um, that was perceived by providers when this pricing change was made. Um, in any case- uh, uh, oh, Arun, you're, you're yeah. out of time. So can you get to the conclusion, please? Sorry to interrupt. Sure. Um, and yeah. uh, Jacques, just to your point, I mean, most of the providers actually did not change the slider at all during those eight weeks. And maybe in the Q&A session, we can sort of explore why. Um, we uh, sort of, I'll skip over those, but like, you know, the, the platform eventually rolled out the partial control, um, like, you know, option. Um, the eventual sort of marketplace impact was lower than the measured treatment effects. Um, like, you know, this is sort of something that has been documented a lot in other studies as well. Um, but our estimates were that like, you know, there were revenue increases of about 25% on average post rollout. Um, and we did some sort of simple difference in difference analysis that is in the paper that um, like, you know, sort of documents that. So my summary, um, like, you know, what I learned from this study was that, um, you know, when you're designing these mechanisms and centralizing things as a platform, uh, managing the transition matters just as much as like, you know, designing the optimal mechanism. Um, and there are different factors that sort of mediate this balance between centralized control and decentralization. Um, objectives, um, like, you know, sort of contract violations um, and so on. And, uh, you know, platforms are well advised to sort of use nuance when balancing these provider incentives with platform incentives. I'll stop there. Apologies for taking three minutes more than I was supposed to. So thank you. Thanks so much for that was very interesting. Uh, so Shane, uh, now it's uh, your turn for the discussion. Uh, let's see, can you hear me okay? Yes. Good, okay, great, thanks. Uh, so, uh, you know, I, I learn a lot from Arun's work. It's really a pleasure to be asked to discuss at this time and uh, uh, thanks for getting me the paper well in advance. <laughs> Uh, and, you know, I really appreciate that. And, uh, I, you know, my job here is to uh, gin up some uh, questions. So, um, uh, you know, let me just say, uh, Rune did a great job of summarizing the motivation and the, the you know, the basic framing and uh, the results. So that makes my job a little easier. So let me go straight to a, a controversy. Let me try something. If you were, if you were trained in the Chicago tradition, uh, uh, you know, one of the earliest principles you learn in the Chicago tradition is price controls are doomed to failure. Centralized price controls never can overcome the benefits of decentralized decision making because so many of the participants in a decentralized marketplace have far more information about their own reservation values and and so on, uh, than any centralized decision maker could have. And the decentralized price control, I say price control because that's where many, much of this intuition comes from, like a government is bound to fail. It's bound to get the prices wrong and that's going to induce distortions. And, you know, we've, we've come a long way from that initial intuition. And the paper, in fact, I think one of the most interesting things about the paper is it made me think really hard about why platforms have made us reconsider that in that Chicago in tradition. And I'm going to rephrase some of the things Arun already said, but as answers to the Chicago challenge. Okay, so one of the ways the uh, paper says you can answer this challenge is um, that the platform can design a menu, uh, even a menu for pricing, such that it simplifies user search and that benefits users so much that it generates adoption for the platform as a whole and therefore you get larger sales and whatever might have been lost to any individual provider 
from losing pricing controls is gained overall for the platform be, by having more users and a larger user base. Uh, a second thing related to that is you could have a commitment to a pricing device that then also generates a user response that's positive. And then again, you get the same dynamics of a larger user base and what any individual supplier might have lost is more than overwhelmed by user adoption. Now, now by analogy, uh, the, the paper doesn't really address that with empirical facts but it, it seemed like it could uh, uh, merely from just telling us if there was an, ado uh, you know, an adoption decision, maybe it was too short term to address because the experiment was too, too short. But I would love to have seen something like whether repeat users came back more frequently or something like that. Uh, uh, or whether the, uh, actually the drop in options maybe was a positive for some people because it made search easier. So that that's one provocative thing I could say here. Um, let me do another provocative thing. Another way you might respond to the Chicago challenge, and Arun sort of said this explicitly, so I, I can say, it's great, so I can say this just really quick, which is uh, it's specialization. So suppliers or amateurs don't have the, you know, uh, uh, specialized knowledge to price appropriately. And the uh, Centralized platform is is a specialist, it's not an amateur, it's in this market uh, repeatedly, and so collects information, so much information that it can make a better estimate of what prices ought to be than any amateur on average can make. And even if it was imposing a distortion, it would more than make up for that by having a better estimate. That's the kind of model that we have in mind. And, um, uh, you know, the paper actually does start to make that argument. And, and it seemed to me that if that's an argument, you want to say a couple things. You want to talk a lot about trust. Arun brought it up, but it didn't bring up empirically. That would imply probably the suppliers who had less experience would drop first uh, or exit first, or you would get something like, um, uh, experience on the platform with, uh, you know, it might be continuous in experience, um, willingness to use the, uh, to submit themselves to centralized pricing. Uh, I, I go to an, a third explanation that uh, way you would uh, answer um, the Chicago challenge and, and, it, and actually the paper talks a lot about this and, and uh, Arun alluded to it, you were running out of time. I actually found this very interesting. And it's the, it was the explanation that in some sense the hassles uh, is the way I understood your managerial explanation. The hassle to a supplier here of bringing the product to market uh, is so high that there's both a, a, a upfront hassle and that they're amateurs and they have to learn what they need to do. And then there's a per transaction hassle, again, because they're amateurs and then they have to uh, continually find out what the market's doing this week or that week. And that, that the hassle itself induces them just to stay out of the market because it's, it, unless the price is high enough. Uh, and this, this explanation I thought was actually really rather interesting. And it, it, it um, again, it would look for, you would look for evidence of it in things like uh, experience or maybe type of car or, or value of car. So the lower value cars just would, it wouldn't be worth the hassle. It wouldn't be worth the fixed cost, but with a high value car or high margin car, you, it'd be worth the trouble. So I was looking for something like that um, as, as ev further evidence uh, for that explanation. And then finally I'll finish, uh, right, I, you, I got five minutes, right? That's what you wanted, uh, right? Um, you know, with uh, uh, thanks for your patience. Uh, I'd finish. I finished, I love the last explanation about the ones who had some pricing flexibility seem to have been happier, That's, which is so interesting. And um, what that reminded me of and is this uh, interesting tension you find 
uh, between manufacturers and distri distributors where the manufacturers have a suggested retail price and the distributors, you know, can or can't stay with that price or discount off it or, you know, margin on it and get and try to not to be informed about it. And as you pro properly note, there's this tension in that relationship and has been for, you know, no under seen for decades. And it sort of reminded me when they had like the suggested price from the central planner. And then it says, well, you can vary 20% here, 30% there. You can go either way. It, it's, it's as if a, a buyer, I mean, a supplier is supposed to know, well, I have too many dents in my car, so I'm going to discount it. Or I consider my car to be high end, so I'm going to make a higher margin or something. And, and I didn't quite understand exactly how to think about that. But it seemed like that was really pretty interesting and uh, an interesting, you know, place to finish because the supplier seemed to be much happier with that. So that, that was it for trying to be uh, provocative. I, you know, I, I thought it was a wonderful paper. I really suggest anybody read it because I learned a lot by reading it. That was great. Okay. Thank, thank, thank you, Shane. Um, it's, uh, I mean, all, all of these are sort of, uh, good competing explanations. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll just clarify a couple of things. Um, I, I, I don't know if, uh, you know, an, if Apostolos is online, he may be able to address this. Um, um, I don't recall if we had looked at sort of the variation in tenure of people who actually exited. Um, you know, that's that's actually sort of, I think there's a lot we could learn from that. Um, I was just sort of quickly glancing at the current draft of the paper to see if there was anything in there. And, um, but, 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 you know, if we do, if we haven't, that's certainly sort of something that, that we'll look into. I mean, the papers that's sort of an interesting point where it's uh, sort of been accepted for publication conditionally, but, you know, and the conditions are weak, but it also means we can sort of make whatever changes we want um, before it um, before it actually gets published, one 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 would hope, um, like you know, we're within within bounds, of course. Um, now the uh, I I I think the real explanation, you know, at least um, for why there's this uh, revenue benefit um, is twofold. Um, one is the uh, you know the, the the amateur versus specialist. Um, you know, there is certainly a sophistication in pricing that, you know, sort of could. Um, oh, and Apostolos uh, is, in, is actually sort of online. He has managed, he's in the chat box and is willing to take sort of all the difficult questions about methodology that you guys might have. Um, and he says, we did look into tenure, um, no difference, same with car value that like, you know, there were no sort of systematic patterns of difference. Um, you know, uh, within the, to those who exited and those who didn't. And so it, it's, it's sort of uh, this expertise, but it's also, um, you know, in some ways this misaligned objective story, which is, um, you know, the platform is optimizing revenue. And this is the case with a lot of platforms, right? I mean, this is the whole joy of the platform model, um, like, you know, scale without mass, like, you know, sort of the asset light world in which you have a very, you know, uh, a simplistic way to think about it is that the platform is maximizing revenue while the provider is maximizing profit. And so, um, you know, that, that, that was what motivated looking at um, sort of revenue per mile as sort of a rough indicator of like, you know, sort of what are these variable costs that people are bearing and what are the fixed costs that they're bearing. And so, you know, I, I, I interpret the difference between the two transaction, the, the two treatment groups um, as being a combination of, um, you know, making, <clears throat> you know, the people with pricing control had the ability to make adjustments so as to align, um, <clears throat> you know, to, to, to sort of take out the transactions or to sort of change the price in a way for those for whom price was too low <clears throat> given heterogeneity um, in a way that um, <clears throat> kept their revenue at uh, where it would have been while sort of taking out the unprofitable transactions or the hugely unprofitable transactions. 
Um, and um, <clears throat> given that a lot of the providers didn't make any changes at all, um, this sort of psychological contract violation thing that like, you know, I'm just happier when I have control. Um, and uh, so it's, um, you know, I wish we had the ability to sort of more clearly tease out these two alternative explanations, the sort of the quote unquote economic explanation and the behavioral explanation. But maybe that's something that I can sort of toss back to um, the audience as like, you know, something to delve deeper into in the centralization versus decentralization studies um, in and follow. Yeah. And uh, David, to your question, yes, this does, um, it seems like yield was much lower for T1. Would this not capture in part the different incentives of the owners and the platform? You know, the treatment groups were ex ante identical, um, you know, on a wide variety of measures that we sort of tested them on. And so, um, you know, they start out with the same incentives. It's just that the people who have the pricing control are able to change price in a way that is aligned with whatever their objective function is. And, um, you know, as a consequence are overall, like, you know, have to resort less to the non-price reactions, like, you know, cutting availability or, um, uh, you know, sort of canceling transactions. <clears throat> 